Good day, brothers and sisters in Christ. Welcome to our virtual Sunday gathering. We're glad that you're worshiping the Lord with us today. Praise the Lord, who is the source of everything, for He has provided our daily needs. Because of this, we ought to express our thanksgiving to Him. Let us bless the Lord with all our hearts. To begin, I will read the word of the Lord found in 1 Chronicles chapter 29, verses 11 to 13. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty. For all that is in heavens and in the earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord. You are exalted as head above all. Both riches and honor from you, and you rule over all. In your hand are power and might, and in your hand it is to make great and to give strength to all. And now we thank you, our God, and praise your glorious name. Let us pray. Lord, be blessed in every day of our lives. Thank you for the joy and enthusiasm you have given to us. We praise and worship you. In Jesus' name, amen. We encourage everyone to join us as we joyfully sing to the Lord. You are the strength of my heart. You are the strength of my heart. I can rely on you. I can rely on you. overwhelmed I will look to you alone got my rock got my rock got my rock you will stand when others fall you are faithful through it all got my rock got my rock got my rock in the blessing in the pain through it all you never To you alone, got my rock, got my rock, got my rock. You will stand when others fall. You are faithful through it all. Got my rock, got my rock, got my rock. In the blessing, the pain. Through it all, you'll never fail. Overwhelmed, I will look to you alone. Got my rock, got my 
Faithful through it all, God, my rock, God, my rock, God, my rock.
Good day, brothers and sisters in the Lord. Welcome to uh, our online gathering. Uh, I praise and thank the Lord that I am able to join with you in uh, studying God's Word today. And I pray that uh, you are all well together with your family and friends who are with you in uh, watching this uh, uh, gathering, online gathering. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we ask for your wisdom to be upon us this day as we listen to your words. I pray that this will help us in the situation that we are experiencing during this time. May it give us courage and may it allow us to live lives as salt and light to people around us and may we apply all of these things, Lord, so that we may glorify you 
our Father through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Salamat, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. One of the areas I believe during this time that many of us, all of us believers in the Lord Jesus Christ should pray is in the area of the education of our children. With the situation of COVID, this pandemic that we are experiencing right now, I know many of you guys are experiencing a lot of confusion and a lot of challenges uh, as your children uh, studies and goes, go through these uh, online uh, sessions with their teachers and other uh, things that they do in, uh, as they study. At home, we have, uh, I, I have one college student, uh, our uh, student worker, and my son who is going through his elementary grade three during this time, and based on the situation that I see to them, uh, and the, their frustration, especially the college student that we have, I realize that this time is really challenging, my brothers and sisters, when it comes to the education of our children. One of the things uh, the, my, uh, our, our college student tells us is that she could, not, she could barely understand the words that their teachers are trying to com communicate and convey and teach to them. And um, sometimes and many times the connections of, of our internet, not probably not just at home but all over the Philippines, are crazy. You know, um, it comes, it has a connection now, and on the next uh, minute, nothing at all. Not only that, many of our teachers right now are are, are so new into this type of uh, you know way of teaching, wherein. Um, according to our college student, many of the, her teachers gave a lot of, you know, uh, assignments and uh, reading assignments and a lot of projects, every subject just to cope up with not meeting physically. So it's so crazy in the situation that we have now. And I know that many of you who have three, four, or five students at home are experiencing a lot worse than what we are experiencing at home. And uh, probably some of you have not yet done that because uh, it is still, I believe, in October where uh, uh, the public school would begin. But um, I know that there are a lot of uh, worries already that is going on there, which is why we really need to pray, you know, starting classes in October. That is quite weird. I was a student once, uh, especially during my college years. You know, I was taking up an engineering course. And just like many of the memes that we have today, where uh, nurses and IT students and um, other uh, uh, teachers, uh, you know, and other courses would take pride in their course. They would make a meme out of that. We are doing this while others are only doing that. Uh, I also, together with my classmates in my engineering years, also take, took pride of being an uh, engineering student. But we don't have any meme to express that with. So we express this pride through this uh, uh, bringing of our notebook and our scientific calculator wherever we go. Because it's so easy to bring, you know, our notebook, which is full of mathematical equations, theorems, and uh, formulas, which we only copy in the blackboard of our teachers. But yet, we take pride of showing those things to people and saying how good we are, how good I was as a student. And especially with a scientific calculator where many actually doesn't know how to use and we take pride of that. I take pride of that. And by bringing those two things, I tell myself that I am a good student. I am doing well. I would show off to people that I was a good student. Uh, one time my, my, my cousin came from, uh, from abroad. She, was a, she, she is a nurse 
and we had lunch and I purposely placed my notebook uh, in front of uh, or beside her plate so that she would see my notebook and would start to look at it. And when she did, she found it, she looked at it, and she opened, took a glance at it, and she says these words, I could never understand that. You are so amazing. And, uh, you know, my ego bloated up. You know, I was so proud of, of who I was, uh, an engineering student. But then when you really look at it, when you would investigate my grade, Knowing the fact that just a semester ago, I failed in a major subject. You know, I was really not good, a good student back then. But because of this, you know, physical thing where we can, where I can express how good I was as a student, I, you know, I uh, deceived myself and people around me as well. You know, when you look at humanity, it's actually like that. In front of God's Word, you know, we see that because of the fall, humanity has this tendency for us to bloat ourselves and make ourselves you know, significant and tell ourselves that we are okay, we are good, we are moral people, we are kind of people, and whatever we do matters. In uh, the preaching series of Louis Giglio um, called The Indescribable and uh, How Great is Our God preaching series, he explained in that uh, preaching with the, the greatness of our God through the lens of how huge, humongous his creation is and how brilliant his creation is. And in comparison with earth and with humanity, uh, compared to the universe, we are actually insignificant. And he said in those, he said in those preaching, he said these words that the sin has this tendency in us to bloat ourselves. You know, pride bloats us into thinking that we are significant, we are important, we are the center of the universe. But when we look into God's Word, we realize that the Bible describes us as like a chaff or a dust that the wind blows away. Our lives are insignificant. The Bible tells us that we are like uh, grass that at a moment it grows and in the next instant it withers. King Solomon says these words in the book of Ecclesiastes that vanity of vanities, everything in life is, is but a vanity. The Hebrew word of vanity, there is the word hevel, which means it's like a vapor, it's like a mist. It comes up and it's gone the next second. However, again, because of the, the fall, we tell ourselves the opposite of what the Bible describes us. We tell ourselves that we are significant you know, I told myself that I was a good student, but in fact, when you would investigate, I was not. I was a horrible student. I was a disaster back then. We tell ourselves of the lies that we are good, we are moral, we are religious people, we are spiritual people, that what we do in this earth, our business, our being a student, it matters. Apart from Christ, nothing actually matters. A couple of weeks ago, I, uh, one of our staff here in GCAF died. And I was able to visit her wake and preach there. And as I was preaching, I, I realized that there were a lot of people gathering together. And I realized also that Many of them are families and uh, relatives of uh, one of, uh, of the staff that died. It's actually a barangay full of uh, relatives and family. And you know, especially when you are preaching the gospel, when you know that there are people who are probably listening for the first time and many of them are listening, 
uh, you tend to be fiery in explaining the gospel you know, with a raspy voice and with uh, probably, uh, and, and many times I would shout and would express how wonderful the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ is. I was probably fiery than, than the usual back then. That after the preaching, a uh, few of the old men of the family came to me and talked to me. First, they thanked me of, 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 for, for visiting and sharing God's word to them. But then they continued to express of, you know, how they experienced many um, struggles and problems in life, yet they were able to overcome it because of how good their family is, how intact their family is or was and is and how, you know, how moral, how kind they are, which is why they experience many victories because of how good their family is. And as I was listening, I was telling myself, Lord, continue to reveal to them the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ that apart from you, we are actually nothing, Lord. But then as, as I was listening to them, I was also distracted by uh, Lani, si Bunbun, and uh, Kuya Rainford who is eating the ube biko there. And I really wanted to eat, but these guys continued on talking and talking. But I thank the Lord that they stopped and I was able to eat the biko, which is so delicious. <laughs> But we tell ourselves that. We tell our, these lies to ourselves that we are okay, we are good, we are doing well, our life is significant, our life matters. And likewise, in Matthew 21, 23 to 32, we see here of a situation where there, are, uh, where there is this religious leaders who comes to the Lord Jesus Christ who would now, in their line of thinking of who they are and what they have done would now try to trap Jesus. Uh, again, I don't know how many times they have already done this. They still didn't learn. But prior to this, uh, to, to verse 23, we see that Matthew has purposely uh, placed before it two events so that uh, these, this particular verses would make sense to us as we would uh, listen to it. The first event was in the area of Jesus, you know, trashing the, the uh, temple sellers. Uh, in the vicinity of the temple, Jesus was so angry at them to a point that he trashed all of the things that they were selling because instead of the temple being a, an area where the people would Pray for the nations. It was su supposed to be an area where the nations will be blessed because of the prayer of the people. The nations were now, uh, you know, it was now a cause or a stumbling block from the nations because many of the people who visit to the temple will be deceived by this den of thieves, according to Jesus. The sellers who would try to deceive them of their money. The next event of that was when Jesus, this was discussed last week, where Jesus together with his disciples saw a fig tree who, doesn't, who did not bear fruit and Jesus cursed that fig tree. It was a symbol of Israel who is not bearing fruit anymore. And in fact, they have, be, they have been uh, a, a stumbling block to the nations which tells us that they have failed in their primary purpose, which God told Abraham in Genesis chapter 12. Genesis chapter 12 tells us that God says to Abraham that I will bless you. And through me blessing you, you will become a blessing to the nations. Instead, Israel at that point have become a stumbling block to the nations. Now here comes verse 23. Jesus entered the temple and he started teaching there. 
And these chief priests and elder of the people came to him asking this question. By what authority are you doing these things and who, who gave you this authority? Again, this question is uh, full of you know, ba- you know, uh, many things that are in here. This is a heavy question. Because it comes from the heart of a people, of a group of people who have so much pride in, them, in themselves, who have told themselves lies after lies to a point that they believe that these lies are true. If we are to uh, restate this question of these people, we would, realize, we would probably put it this way. Jesus, we are the religious leaders of this place, of the Jews. Our authority came from the law of Moses with which every requirement which was so hard to do to accomplish Jesus, we accomplished it. Well, first of all, we, the priest, comes from the line of Levi, the ones that Moses declared to be the priestly tribe. That's our last name. We studied the law under a great teacher, Jesus. We have memorized the commandments of Moses, the Torah to the letter. We have done great things for us to be able to now have this authority and uh, position in our society. It comes from our hard work and our family. That is where our authority comes from. How about you? By what authority are you doing these things and you, who gave you this authority? You see, the kind of, you know, lies and messages these people or the religious leaders tell themselves. They expose themselves, their weakness, through the lies that they believe that are true in thinking that righteousness and spiritual authority would be achieved if we just, you know, have the right family name and we would just, you know, uh, do, exert a lot of effort to fulfill these requirements. Some of it are already man-made. Some of it comes from the law of Moses. They have forgotten that their ancestors, Abraham, Moses, Jacob, and Isaac, in Genesis 15, it says there that Abraham believed in God and it was credited to him as righteousness. Righteousness will be credited to them, to them not because of their last name, not because of how hard they have worked following the laws of Moses, but because of their faith and their belief in Yahweh. And by virtue of this righteousness that has been given to them, they will now have a spiritual authority. They've forgotten that. They thought that they're having the right family name and having the right kind of, uh, you know, exerting of their efforts would make them a spiritual authority. Jesus knew that. Being omniscient, Jesus saw through their lies. Jesus answered their question with another question. Verse 24 and 25 says these words, I will also ask you one thing, which if you tell me, I will also tell you by what authority I do these things. Jesus said, the baptism of John, was that from what source? From heaven or from men? Now the religious leaders were caught unaware of this question of the Lord Jesus Christ. To a point that they did not know how to respond. 
they collaborated with themselves, asking themselves, how do we answer this question? Because if we do, if we say that this comes from heaven, then he will tell us, that, why did you not believe him? And if we answer him that uh, this question does not come from heaven but only from himself, then the people would be angry at us because the people believed that John was a prophet. So they decided to say this to Jesus. Uh, we do not know the answer, Jesus. For which Jesus also replied, Well, neither I will tell you what you ask of me. You know? This is what happens when our righteousness and our spiritual authority are based upon our own efforts and, you know, the men's approval. In front of the infallible word of God, the integrity of these people shattered. In front of the holy word of God, the integrity of these religious leaders falter because they base their authority from the continuously changing landscape of man's approval. This exposes that in the first place, the authority that they seem to have are actually very unstable, unreliable, and ultimately false. And because of that, what authority do they have to demand of Jesus to answer their question. You see the genius of Jesus here when it comes to trapping the trappers. Jesus also brought up the issue of John the Baptist. You know, during this time, John the Baptist is already dead. By bringing up John the Baptist, it was also a tactic which you cannot prepare for it. Whatever you, you think, however, however you function, you can never, never prepare for it. You know, John plays an essential role in the connection of the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. After the prophet Malachi, there had never, the, God has not sent any more prophet for 400 years. Until John the Baptist came, he was considered by the people as a prophet. He was considered by the scriptures as a prophet. As many of these religious leaders have read and have heard of Isaiah chapter 40, verses 3 to 5, a voice of one calling in the desert, prepare the way for the Lord. This was a prophetic um, uh, message about John the Baptist, about who he is. You know, Zechariah, the father of John the Baptist, was also a priest. And um, the angel Gabriel gave him this prophecy. And uh, I believe many of the priests knew of this prophecy because Zechariah had told them. In Luke 1, 15 to 17, it says there, John, he will be a great, uh, he will be great in the sight of the Lord. You know, he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even before he is born. He will bring back many people of Israel to the Lord their God. And he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and the power of Elijah. Which tells us that he has a prophet, uh, a, a ministry is that of Elijah, a prophet to make ready a, pre uh, a people prepared for the Lord. So in other words, when the, the prophetic message of Gabriel says that he will bring back many people of Israel to the Lord, their God. It's not only a physical bringing back, just like Nehemiah and Zerubbabel coming from the uh, place of uh, exile back to the promised land. But it's really more of a spiritual bringing back to the people by virtue of the cleansing power of the baptism through water, which is why what John the Baptist would declare every time he would preach to the people are the words, repent, be baptized, for the kingdom of heaven is near. This was a repentance of the previous life of Israel, of continuous rebellion. A recalling of repentance from the life of continuous idolatry. 
and a repentance of the mindset of Israel where they think that righteousness and uh, spiritual authority and fervor to the Lord comes by, you know, exerting a lot of effort in following the law when it's not. Genesis 15 tells us that Abraham believed in God and it was credited to him as righteousness. Again, they forgot about that, which is why John calls them to repent and go back to the Lord in repentance and faith. But then again, because of the ascetic kind of life of John the Baptist, it was not so appealing to these religious leaders. When they look at John the Baptist, he is so different from us, man. You know, we are, you know, putting nice dress to make ourselves, to let, our, let people see us as people who are, who is worthy to be respected. But John, he doesn't, you know, Clothes like us, his clothes are not like us. His smell is not like us. What he eats is not like us. What he preaches is not like us. But don't worry, don't worry. He's just a small time religious worker. We are the big boys of Judaism, we are the leaders and authority when it comes to spirituality among these people, this guy, small time, big time. But little did they know that many of the people have started to look at John the Baptist and have believed in his message and have received the baptism of repentance and have believed that he is a prophet. These religious leaders may have ridiculed, ridiculed the followers of John the Baptist. They probably even have laughed at the ministry of John the Baptist to a point that the, the time, probably during the time of his death, they have celebrated now the, uh, the small time religious worker is now dead. We can now go on with our life and our work. Continue to tell our, th themselves of these lies of who they are. And they believed their lies. And Jesus continued to talk to them. Jesus will now make a point. He's not done yet. Jesus now makes a point. Instead of answering the question, Jesus gave to them a parable that is rooted in John's role as the one who prepares the way for the Messiah. In verse 28, it says here, but what do you think about this? A man had two sons, and he came to the first and said, Son, go work today in the vineyard. And he answered, I will not. But, but afterwards, he regretted it and went. The man came to the second son and said the same thing. And he answered, I will, sir. But he did not go. Which of the two did the will of his father? They said, these religious leaders said, the first, Jesus said to them, truly I say to you that the tax collectors and prostitutes will get into the kingdom of God before you. Now, this parable is, uh, you know, very significant when it comes to uh, the situation that they have right now. Jesus divided the Jewish people into two groups. The first group are the people who knew of God, who knew of the commandments, you knew the history of Israel, but has decided because of their life, because of their work, because of their situation, that they cannot follow it, which is why they live their lives contrary to the laws of Moses. These are the prostitutes, the criminals, the tax collectors, and other people who have clearly abandoned the law of Moses. They are the people who looked at themselves in the mirror of the law and they see themselves full of dirt, 
full of sin. And as they continue to look at themselves, they would realize of how unworthy they are and how they are not able to save themselves because they are trapped in the pit of sin. But when the opportunity comes, when they hear of a prophet who, re, who, who, who preaches the words, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near, they realize that they have hope. And they started to listen to this prophet and have received the baptism of repentance and now they can start their life anew. And the parable says that by believing in that message of John the Baptist, they have crossed over from the old covenant to this new covenant wherein they are actually, they, have, they are doing the work in the vineyard of God. They said yes to the grace of God, which has allowed them to enter into the kingdom, the vineyard of God. On the other hand, the second group, the group who said yes to the laws of Moses, who believed that if doing the laws of Moses letter by letter, then they would be right with God. And they tell themselves that, that they are right with God, even though if, if, you would, if they would look at themselves in light of the law, the mirror that is the law of Moses, they would also see of how, you know, filthy they are. But yet, because they followed it, they put up a front where people say to them that they truly are people who are following the laws of Moses. They have started to believe in themselves. They have believed in the lies that they are telling themselves that they are on working in God's vineyard. And when John the Baptist came and preached of repentance and going back to the Lord, what would they repent of? They are already working in God's vineyard. That's they, the, what, what they're thinking is they're already okay with the Lord. They are doing well. What are the things that they need to repent? They cannot see their sin anymore because of the pride and because of the lies that they tell themselves. This disqualified them in the new covenant wherein it's by grace that they are working in uh, the, the, the vineyard of God, not through their efforts. It disqualified them and it made them not workers of the, uh, of the vineyard of God anymore. And Jesus said these words, Truly I say to you, the tax collectors and prostitutes will, will get into the kingdom of God before you. For John came to you in the way of righteousness and you did not believe him. John came by way of righteousness, not again because of his effort, because of the lineage that John has, but just like their ancestors, righteousness came to John the Baptist by virtue of his belief in God, not in his works. Now John has a very essential part in uh, the connection of the old covenant and new covenant. Many people think that the old covenant and the new covenant are two different things. I believe the Bible tells us that it's actually a one big story, one big story of God wherein the old covenant is part one, the new covenant is part two. Standing in the middle of that is a John the Baptist who's trying to smoothen things up for the Lord Jesus Christ who is at the center of it all. Because it was Jesus Christ who fulfills the old covenant and by virtue of the Lord Jesus Christ, those who are not eligible to enter into the kingdom of God 
now can enter tax collectors, thieves, criminals, those who are not worthy, the nations, the Gentiles, you and me, by virtue of, of the grace of God, through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, we can now enter into this new covenant. It's one story. And John the Baptist is the one who smoothens the way for the Israelites to realize that they have not actually fulfilled their purpose. Jesus Christ will fulfill that purpose. Through John the Baptist, three things are made clear. One, righteousness comes to Israel when they will realize and turn away from their sinful filth, their sins. Righteousness will come to Israel when by faith they will turn to the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And lastly, thirdly, this Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world is the ultimate agent by which their, the, the purpose, their purpose will be fulfilled. It's not Israel anymore who will become the ultimate blessing to the nations, but it is Jesus Christ who will be the ultimate blessing to the nations. But then again, these chief elders and religious leaders continued to tell themselves that they are doing fine. We are doing okay. Morally, we are more righteous than other people. Spiritually, we are doing a lot of things with which, siguro, we are okay now with God. Politically, we have the power to persuade people. Financially, we have... Uh, uh, good standing, we are comfortable uh, and status-wise, they are living in comfortable and living in abundance. In, uh, in other words, they tell themselves that they are righteously and spiritually following God and that the result of this is that they are living a comfortable life. They believe so much in their lies that they missed the Messiah. They missed Jesus. We also tell ourselves of many lies that we are okay, we are doing well, we are good, our life matters, and all of these things. And which is why it's so hard for many people out there for the gospel to penetrate in their hearts because they seem to think and they're telling themselves that they don't need it. They have everything in life that they need for them to live comfortably. There's a you know, a youth leader who came to me once and told me of the reality of campus ministry. The campus ministry where many of the students are well off, are so hard to penetrate to this uh, to this campus ministry compared to campuses wherein many of the people are struggling with, when it comes to finances. You know, according to them, you know, just put up a pancit bihon or pancit canton, people would come together and then uh, they would be thankful for the, the free meal and they would start to listen to the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ and for, for some of them, it would make sense but for these campuses wherein it's well off, you know, what's a pancit bihon for them? They have Starbucks for coffee in breakfast. They seem to think that they are okay with life. They seem to think that even through this pandemic, they can, you know, they will be okay. They are secured financially. What is there a need to be saved for? We are okay in life. We are well provided. We don't have much problem in life. There's internet that can satisfy our deepest longing. There's endless YouTube and endless Facebook which can amuse us. Media which can make us happy. 
What is there a need to be saved for? Why do we need a Messiah? Many times, we tell ourselves that as well. These are the lies that are keeping us from truly experiencing the life of satisfaction, a life that is, you know, satisfied in God because we missed it and we tell ourselves with these lies and these lies have become our truth. Now, just like last week, this pandemic brought the worst of us. Many believers, that includes me. Because there are many struggles in different areas because of the struggles, the different areas of our lives, there are many things that we tell ourselves. And many of them are lies. One of the things that I tell myself is like this. It seems like that I am not fruitful enough during these times. Probably I should, you know, take a time off from ministry. Maybe I, I need to go home, you know, and, and you know, experience life in the uh, vicinity of my beloved family. You know, probably I would stop serving in GCAF and go home and help in family business, which could give me comfort and uh, good things in life. But then as I sift all of that, and as I put all of those thoughts captive in front of the light of the infallible word of God, I realize this thing that actually I am telling myself that I can experience satisfaction in life by following the desires of my heart instead of following the purposes of God in my life, which is the biggest mistake any believer of Christ can ever do. You see how twisted and how deceiving these lies we tell ourselves. In light of God's infallible word, I found out that my desires are nothing. I found out that I was never, you know, a good engineering student. I was never a good person. I was never a good son to my parents. I was never a good brother to my siblings. I was never a good friend to my friends. I was never good enough in God, in light of God's word. But yet, because of this grace that is overflowing in God through the Lord Jesus Christ, I realize that in my deepest weakness, God is strong. That He is the strength of my heart. When I am not good enough, Jesus is more than sufficient. When I feel like I don't have any purpose in this world, Jesus is my satisfaction. When I feel sad, light of God's word, Jesus is my joy. Jesus is my peace. And Jesus is my satisfaction. Jesus only can satisfy whatever it is that I long for in life. And He gives that to me grace after grace every day of my life. And I hope you will experience that as well, my friends. That as you go through these darkest times in the world, of our lives, we will see that it's only in the Lord Jesus Christ that we can experience the greatest satisfaction. It's only in Jesus Christ that all these lies we tell ourselves would crumble and I pray that we would experience that this time. Let's bow down our heads and let us pray. Thank you, Father, for your words of truth. I pray, Lord, that we will experience more of you, more of your grace, so that we will be able to push away 
these lies that we tell ourselves. I pray, Father, for everyone who's listening now, who seem to think that they are okay with life apart from Jesus Christ. I pray that the Holy Spirit would convict their hearts, that they would repent and would turn from their self-satisfying ways and turn to the Lord Jesus Christ but because it is only through Him that they will experience true peace, joy, and satisfaction. We thank you and we bless you. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. God bless you, my brothers and sisters. Good day. It's time to worship the Lord through our giving of tithes and offering. Let me encourage you through the Word of God. In Psalm 96, verse 7 to 9, it says, Ascribe to the Lord. All you families of nation, ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due to His name. Bring an offering and come unto His courts. Worship the Lord in the splendor of His holiness. Tremble before Him all the earth. The Word of God says that we should be Ascribing to the Lord what is due to Him. All praises, adoration, because everything comes from Him. As we worship, part of, our, part of it is our giving. Let us give joyfully unto the Lord. Let us pray. Almighty God, we praise your name. We thank you because in spite of this crisis, you are faithful to us. You sustain us. You give us life. You provided everything we need. And thank you even for the joy that you have given to our hearts that we can always be hopeful for tomorrow knowing that you are with us, knowing that you are the God who provides all our need. I pray, Father God, that as we continually praise you and honor you, grant us the grace, O Lord God, to live out our faith for your glory and honor. I pray that you would bless your people, bless them with peace, bless them with joy, bless them, O God, with hope that is found in Christ alone. In your name, we pray, Amen and Amen.